Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Whether you are a first-time visitor, a long-term member, or anywhere in between, welcome and good morning. And a special greeting to those of us who are worshiping with us online this morning. I have a few announcements for you. Right after our 815 service, you are invited to join our Thoughtful Christian class. Marty Durr will be continuing her Mind on the Mend series. Um, we will be talking about meditation today. Also, a reminder that Tuesday night at MPC is happening this Tuesday, October 17th. Uh, it'll be starting at 5.30. Come out for a meal and bring a friend or two. Another reminder, two weeks from now, on October 29th, we will be having one worship service. Sunday school will start at 9.30. Worship will be at 1030, and then there will be a brunch following worship and a stroll that you're all invited to come join me on. There are plenty of other announcements in your bulletin, so feel free to bring those home and to write all those dates in your calendar. We also have a moment for mission this morning. Good morning. Again this year, the deacons are hosting the Tree of Warmth to collect new hats, scarves, gloves, mittens, and socks that will be donated to local agencies that support those with needs with, excuse me, within our community. The tree will be placed outside the back door, rear entrance, portico, porch, whatever you call that back there, and this allows us to also invite individuals from the community to take items from the tree that would be helpful for them. You can begin to decorate our tree with the hats, scarves, gloves, mittens, and socks on Sunday, October 22nd, next Sunday. Recently, the deacons decided we're going to extend the collection date, so you may have read in the October um, cornerstone that we were ending the first week of November, but it's going to go till the 12th of November, so from next Sunday until the 12th of November. The deacons thank you in advance for your support in helping to keep people in our community more comfortable and warm this winter. In light of everything that has been happening in the news this past week, Pastor Catherine has written a statement reflecting on the war in Israel-Palestine. You can find this half sheet of paper in your bulletin. Let us take a moment to take a deep breath and to exhale and to offer our prayers to God for a world with peace and an end to war. Let us pray. Eternal God, in your perfect well, no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness. No word is spoken without love. Spread your spirit across the world, and especially in Israel, Palestine, so that all people of every race and faith may know peace. To you be the dominion and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please stand to worship God. Please join me in our call to, to worship. 
The heavens tell of the glory of God. May our worship reflect God's glory. The sky proclaims God's creation. May we see each other as the creation of God. Let our prayer and praise, singing and proclamation, witness to the love of God. With Christians across land and time, let us worship. do we confess our sin? Because all fall, fall short of the glory of God. But why do we do this together? Because we are a community, a covenant people. Then let us confess our sin. Good and gracious God, forgive us when we think that we can earn your love. For we can neither earn nor deserve all that you have done for us. Help us to resent our worldly attitudes and values so that we can celebrate new lives in Jesus Christ. Whatever earthly gains we may have experienced, we even are them as loss compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus, Jesus as our Lord. This we pray in Christ's name. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Alleluia and amen.
I'd like to invite any um, beloved children of God to join me <laughs> back up front. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll even have a few other ones to join us. Yep, you know right where to go. Thank you, choir and Mr. Mark, for being part of our worship this morning. Um, your singing was beautiful, and we thank you for sharing your gifts with us. So nod your head if at school sometimes you have a substitute teacher. That ever happened? Yeah. Well, Miss Kathy is away on a short vacation, and she asked me, Miss Katie, to be her substitute teacher. And just like the real teachers at school, they always leave a good lesson plan, and that's just what Miss Kathy has done for me. So today's lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew. It's called the Parable of the Pearl. And you know that Jesus sometimes told parables or stories to help us to love and follow him. So let's listen to find out why a man was willing to sell everything he had to pay the price for the perfect pearl. So there's the man, and there's a whole bowl of pearls. There was a merchant, that is, a man who bought and sold pearls. He spent his days looking for really nice pearls that he could sell. He was very good at his job. He selected only the finest pearls to sell. How many pearls had he seen? Hundreds? Thousands? Then, one day, he saw a pearl that was so different and so wonderful, he gasped. <gasps> How amazing. Right before his eyes, he saw the most beautiful pearl ever. But this pearl cost a lot of money. What could he do? The merchant did something very unusual. He went home and he sold everything he owned. Then he had enough money to buy the pearl. He knew he would not rest until he could have this perfect pearl, even at a great price. He gave up everything he had until at last he owned the one thing that was the most precious to him in the world. Did we find out why a man was willing to sell everything he had to pay the price for the perfect pearl? We did, we found that out. Sometimes we think, especially grown-ups think this, that if we own a lot of things, we will be happy. But Jesus told this story and wants us to think differently, that our life with Jesus is of great value, just like the man who found the perfect pearl. Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for making us your beloved children. Help us to follow Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being a really good class. I'm going to leave a good note for your teacher. <laughs> Maybe she'll give you extra recess.
Please join, please join me in prayer. As we hear your word read and proclaimed, O oh God, make your ways known to us. Show us your path on which we should walk and lead us in your truth. For you alone are, are the God who saves, the God in whom we trust, and the one on whom we wait. Amen. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect one's own errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The story of God for the people of God. Our second scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. I more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of mine own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ to know the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to what lay hold for which Christ has lay hold of me. Siblings, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call in God and Jesus Christ. The story of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For the fa past five Sundays, we have been talking about habits for community living. These habits, so far honesty, acceptance, benevolence, and intentionality, they reflect the values we find in the teachings of Jesus and throughout scripture. These habits help us to better live with one another as a community of faith. 
celebrating the Holy Spirit that unites us, and then also honoring our unique spiritual gifts. Today, we conclude this series with our final fifth habit, transformation. When I saw that today's theme was transformation, my first thought was, well, this is easy. I can think of a million examples to begin a sermon on transformation. Caterpillars transform into butterflies, seeds into plants, day into night, babies into toddlers, then teenagers, then adults. In fact, we are in the middle of a very season of transformation. We witness the weather grow colder, birds migrate south, and leaves change from green to red and orange. Transformation is taking place all around us all the time. Our popular culture seems almost obsessed with this idea of transformation. It's all over our television screens as we watch people transform their hair, their clothes, or their homes. It's even all over our bookshelves with titles like Miracle Morning, Six Habits That Will Transform Your Life Before 8 a.m. and The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Powerful Lessons in Personal Change. By the way, that is now 13 habits if you are counting and therefore way too long for a sermon series. We tend to measure the success, the effectiveness of a person's transformation based on whether they emerge wealthier, richer, or in some way more attractive or successful. By those standards, Apostle Paul's transformation is less of a glow up and more of a glow down. He began his career as a well-respected, well-known religious leader. But by the time he is writing this letter to the Philippians, he is imprisoned, he is persecuted, and he is stripped of all worldly status and comfort. Paul tells us that before his conversion experience, he had every reason to boast about himself. He was a Jew from a very good family, a descendant of a long line of faithful Jews from the tribe of Benjamin. Not only did Paul have this outstanding pedigree, but he was also a very pious Jew. He was a member of the Pharisees, a Jewish sect of educated legal experts who were dedicated to following the law. Moreover, even among the Pharisees, Paul was exceptional. He was so zealous in his faith that he dedicated his life to chasing after and persecuting those who were seen as a threat to the Jewish faith, including the early church. But then, something happened that transformed Paul from a Christian persecutor to a Christ pursuer. He encountered Jesus. In Philippians, Paul writes that whatever distinguished titles and privileges he once had, he now regards as loss because of Christ. Apart from persecuting others, there was nothing about Paul's former identity that was inherently wrong or evil or sinful. So for Paul, encountering Jesus is not about renouncing his heritage or his Jewish faith. Rather, what Paul means here is that he regards these former titles as loss because he has found something even more valuable. He has found a relationship with Christ. Paul had every earthly reason to boast about himself, but his former boast is overwhelmed and made practically worthless in comparison to knowing Christ. But what does it mean to know Christ? Knowing Christ is not about memorizing every possible Bible trivia question, studying all the world's greatest theologians, or perfectly fulfilling all of God's commandments all the time. If that were true, then knowing Christ would be a nearly impossible task. Instead, knowing Christ is about having a relationship with him, about experiencing the depth of God's love and God's mercy. It is less about always striving for perfection and more about always showing up with an open heart and mind, ready to invite Christ into our lives and be transformed. 
we often think about transformation as one thing that then changes into another, day into night, young to old. Yet knowing Christ works in the opposite direction. It is not about becoming something else entirely. Rather, it's about rediscovering our true selves, who we really are. Who we are beneath our external earthly identities. Who we are when we discard the letters after our names and strip away our fancy titles. Who we are when we remove all the labels that have been assigned to us. Rich, poor, famous, unknown, powerful, weak. After all of it falls away, what is uncovered is our true identity. Beloved children of God. This transformation reminds me of this silly cartoon strip that I saw on Facebook the other day. So imagine this. The scene is a class reunion of bugs. It starts with a moth who boasts to his friends, I became a moth. Next, a butterfly proudly proclaims, I became a butterfly. Then together, the moth and the butterfly, they turn and ask, and what about you, worm? To which the worm replies, I accepted myself for who I am. When we allow Christ to transform us, we become who we already are. External markers of success in social status or lack of success in social status are surpassed by the profound revelation that we are beloved children of God. Everything else? It pales in comparison. Rahab the prostitute becomes Rahab the great-grandmother of Jesus, beloved child of God. Simon the fisherman becomes Peter, a founder of the early church, beloved child of God. Paul the Christian persecutor becomes Paul the apostle who spread the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the known world, beloved child of God. Paul? He makes this transformation sound easy. As if one moment he was hunting down members of the early church, and the next he was preaching in front of the same congregation. However, I doubt it was this easy. I suspect that Paul lost friends, and maybe even some family members, over his decision to pursue Christ. And I wonder if he ever missed his old life of comfort while he's writing these letters in a damp cell. Embracing the transformation that knowing Christ brings can be a wonderful and it can be an exciting journey, but it's not always easy. It's not easy to relinquish our external identities and labels that we have worked so hard to build up and achieve. The world often measures our worth and the worth of others by these same markers, our accomplishments and our gains. We often find ourselves caught up in the cycle of striving for more, of do more and be more, constantly seeking the next promotion, prize or privilege, hoping that all these will provide the validation and fulfillment that we crave. These expectations can be so deeply ingrained in us and our lives that we may fear losing our sense of self-esteem and purpose if we let them go. Yet, knowing Christ it challenges these beliefs. Christ died for us even while we were still sinners. Our intrinsic worth is not contingent upon worldly achievements. We are already Beloved children of God, no title, no award, or anything else can ever be greater than that. We are enough simply because we are. Embracing the transformation that knowing Christ brings is hard. It involves confronting our fears and our insecurities, questioning the values of societal norms, and reevaluating our priorities. It also comes with this revelation. If we are beloved children of God, so is everyone else. The people inside and outside our church 
inside and outside our circles of friendship, the people we like a lot and the people we don't like so much. The revelation that we are all children of God can indeed be humbling and challenging. It compels us to extend the same grace that we have received from God to all those around us, regardless of any worldly label they may have been given. If we are all God's children, there is no more division between us and them. Instead, we are called to recognize the inherent worth of every individual, to treat all people as beloved siblings in our family of faith. Each are equally deserving of our respect, love, and support. So practically speaking, how do we do this? How do we build up a community that welcomes every person as a sibling in faith and celebrates the transformative power of Jesus Christ? Perhaps it starts with embracing these habits for community building that we have been talking about for the past five weeks. With being honest with each other and with ourselves, admitting that community can be joyful and challenging and promising to keep trying anyway. It starts with acceptance, welcoming all people, and with benevolence, trusting in God's steadfast goodness towards us. And building up community it starts with transformation, a willingness to encounter Christ, to know Christ, and be transformed to reorient our values and our lives into all that Christ is calling us to be. Perhaps this starts with introducing ourselves to just one other person in the congregation that we do not yet have a relationship with. Perhaps building community starts and embracing transformation starts with reminding ourselves that we are first and foremost beloved children of God. And everything else comes second. Beloved children of God, God calls you to share this good news to a world that is much in need of transformation. In the name of the Creator, Christ, and Holy Ghost.
Please join me in declaring what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, in your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Liberating God, we praise you for your faithful love for us. You name us and you call us your own. We thank you for the many ways that you demonstrate your love. We see it in the natural world around us, in our relationships, and in those around us. Because we have experienced your love, we come before you with confidence, bringing our needs and the needs of the world. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who live surrounded by violence and threats of violence, from war or political unrest, crime or abuse. We pray for those who have been victims of violent crime, and for those who loved ones have been. We pray for those who find themselves involved in crime and injustice by choice or through coercion. We pray for those who are imprisoned, justly and unjustly. And we pray for peace in Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, and around the world. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our communities, for our homes and our families, for parents and for caregivers, juggling the responsibilities of work and family. We pray for spouses whose marriages are breaking down and for children who are struggling to meet expectations. We pray especially for those who do not have a safe place to call home. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for this congregation, our community of faith, for those who are ill or whose loved ones are ill, for those who feel anxious about the future or feel stuck in the past, for those struggling with faith, for those who minister among us through word and action, for all the people who consider this place a home. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all the names that are on our hearts this day. We pray for Jem and Sandy, Rich and Kim, for Pat, Lloyd, and Mike, for Jean and Stephanie, for Rita and Emmett. We pray for those who care for loved ones. And we pray for all those who mourn. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful God, give us strength and courage to live in faithful obedience to you. Guard our hearts and our minds from all that distracts us from living out our commitment to you. Help us to find our true worth in knowing you more fully and serving you more faithfully. We offer to you the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we unite our hearts and prepare to go out into the world to serve Christ, we give thanks. We open our hearts and we share what we have for the the work of the church. There are places to give your offering, both by the doors or you can text or give online. There are also additional time and talent sheets um, in the back and also in the gathering area. The works of the Lord are wondrous indeed. Let us offer back to God a portion of our time, talents, and financial gifts that have been given to us for the glory of God's name. Please pray with me. Faithful God, we bring our gifts to you to celebrate how you have made a new and everlasting covenant with us. Do not allow us to become proud of being your people, but help us to humbly respond with faith expressed in service. Use us and use our gifts 
to benefit others, we pray. Amen. Now, go out into the world in peace. And remember to keep the faith, to live in hope, and to love one another. And may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and always. Amen. of Christ be with you. Also with you. Share signs of peace with one another. Mm -hmm. 